So first of all, we're going to we're going to be talking about what a zero of a function is quite a bit over the next couple of weeks. And that just means it's a value of x that causes the function to equal zero. So if you're given a function, you find an x value that makes the function value equal to zero. That's what a zero is. Okay. So what we're going to look at too is this is all about quadratic functions. So that's kind of your standard form of a quadratic function is ax squared plus or minus bx plus or minus c. Okay. And a can't be zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to find x-intercepts, basically. And when you find an x-intercept, uh, what you always got to remember is an x-intercept just has an x value, but y is 0. Okay, it's the same thing. It's not real. 0 and x-intercept are not the same thing. Okay, um, so if you have an x-intercept, that's what we call a real 0. So what you do is you set f of x equal to 0. And we talked about this in a previous section. So what we're going to do is on every single example on this, we're going to find zeros or x-intercepts. X okay, and they're all going to be real on this. So all you do on this, this will look real familiar to you, is you set f of x equals zero, and then you solve this quadratic equation. And what we're kind of doing is we're simply reviewing the techniques. There's factoring, there's quadratic formula, there's completing the square, and then there's the square root property. So I'm going to review those things as we go. This one you want to factor on. Okay, so it says use factoring. So you would just factor the, the polynomial. And I'm going to do the factoring pretty quickly. If you have trouble factoring, you want to come see me. That's x and x. For 36, what would you use? 136, 218, what do you think? Just say something. Okay, what do you use for 36 when you're factoring? I'm just assessing your understanding. 1 times 36, 2 times 18. Ah, there we go. Someone answered. Good, okay. So you've got a 5 and a 9. No, did I just say 5 and 9? <laughs> no, you would go um, 4 and 9. How about that? Is that better? Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> The signs go like this. You would have plus 9 minus 4 because 9 minus 4 would give you the plus 5. I do see students in pre-calc a lot of times who need to brush up on factoring like big time. Okay? If you need to do that, you've got to do that. Okay? So the zeros then would be 4 and negative 9 because you just do that in your head. You're really just solving the equation x minus 4 equals 0 and x plus 9 equals 0. So you just do that in your head. So your zeros, we would just say, are x equals 4 and x equals negative 9. Okay, what happens is if you plug in 4 and negative 9, you just get 0. Okay, that's what we just did. Okay, so these problems are all going to be kind of the same thing. I tried to give you different types of factoring problems, though. So number 3, what you would want to do is the same thing. You do that. How do you factor x squared minus 3x? Two parentheses? No. What do you do? What do you do? Pull out the x. Thank you. Okay. So you take an x out. Look, always look for common factors. So that would give x times x minus 3. So in your head, there's two zeros. What are they? Zero and, one. Zero and 3. Good. Because you say x equals 0, and you say x minus 3 equals 0. So you get 0 and 3. Okay. x equals like that. Okay. So it's factoring. Problem four, this is the factoring that students, I, from lots of experience teaching in many years, students a lot of times don't know how to do this one very good. So if you don't, pay cl close attention to this. There's more than one way to teach a student how to do this. I usually just teach students trial and error. When you get in higher math, you're not going to do this factor by grouping thing that often students are taught because you just do quick trial and error. Okay, So this is the way I generally teach this is like this. When we factor this, the first term is 4x squared. Okay, and you can kind of do this in your head. It, the possibilities are 4x and 1x, or 2x and 2x. You're just going to try until you find the right combination. The last number is a 7, so that's nice because there's only one way to get a 7, and that's multiply 1 times 7. Okay, so what you do is you pick. Okay, what I generally tell students to do is if all three of your numbers are close to each other, then pick close. So I would start with 2x and 2x instead of 4 and 1. It may not work, but you've got to start somewhere. So what I'm going to do is just do this. 
I put a 2x and a 2x and a 1 and 7. And then I see if it works. The way I'm going to know it works is if I can make the middle term become negative 3x, and I think it works. So if students would just do this, they wouldn't have trouble. I think a lot of times students think they can do these problems in your head, but it's hard to do that. So that's 2x. Oh, I'm not right on this. That's uh, 14x, so there's no way to make that work, is there? Okay, so that would mean probably scratch the 2 and 2. Okay, so we try again, and then this time what we'll do is we'll do 4x and x, and then we'll do 1 and 7, but the way you do that makes a difference. Okay, let's see if that works. I'm going to do 7 and 1. So if I do that, that gives a 7x. The outside term from FOIL gives a 4x. Now you're trying to make it negative 3x. So that works, doesn't it? Okay, you would have minus 7 and plus 4 like that. So just draw that right down the inner and outer term, and then you can that way you can process it in your head. Otherwise, it's hard to process in your head unless you practice this a lot. So that means the 7 would be minus, and the x would be plus 1. Okay, so that's trial and error, and that's why you're going to do that in higher math. If you learned how to do that by factor by grouping, there's a, it's okay to do it that way, but sometimes you, the problem's a lot more complicated that way. Most of the time, that's the easy way to do it. Just take a little time and figure it out by trial and error. So what you would have then is you would do the two factors are 4x minus 7 and x plus 1. So what you end up doing on that then is solve those two equations. Okay. So with this one, you would add 7 to both sides, and you can do this in your head also. So you have 4x equals 7, divide by 4. So one of your zeros is 7 fourths. The other one, you can do in your head, that's x equals negative 1. Okay, like that. The problems are 100% verifiable. If you took your calculator and plugged those zeros in the function, you're going to get 0. So it's easy to tell you're right. You can catch any mistake you do just by taking a little time to check an answer. Okay? All right, is everybody okay with the factoring on that? Yeah. I know another method of, of this problem, like how you can factor. Um, so you would want to try to find the factors that, um, like that match up for when you multiply the C and then the A. Right. Four times seven is 28. And then you, would, you have to do what's called a factor by grouping problem. That's what I was referring to. If you've learned how to do it that way and you like doing it that way, you can keep doing it that way if you want to. Um, I think that's a good thing to teach in a little bit lower level class. I think in practice, the, the higher up you get, you know, most mathematicians are going to do it the way I did. Just do it by trial and error. Because uh, one thing that happens with the method you're talking about is sometimes when you multiply the A and C, you get a humongous number, and it makes it harder that way. Okay, most of the time, it's just the numbers are small enough, you just do it this way. But you can keep doing it. I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, okay so let's go up to the, the next one here. And a lot of this is just factoring review, so it's worth doing. And we've done this before. So how do you factor x squared minus 25? That's the difference of two squares. So remember, that's the one where you go x and x. Plus 5, minus 5. That's another factoring problem that you learn. So the two zeros are negative 5 and 5. So those are kind of the factoring problems you'll see. Differences of two squares, trinomials, common factor. That's what you want to know from your background. Okay? All right, so that's kind of method one. Um, the second thing we're going to look at is uh, we're going to do what we call the square root method. And the thing is, as a student, when you learn about quadratic equations, you can always use the quadratic formula because it always works, but you don't want to do it that way. You want to use the method that's the least amount of work. Factoring was good on those examples. It's not so good on these. So again, we start the same way. And what happens on this, you just move the 11 to the other side. So you have 11 equals x squared. And then what do you do? You do the square root of both sides. We've talked about this before. And when you do this, the common mistake I see from students is when you do a square root of both sides, you have a plus minus answer. The quadratic equation has two answers to it. There are times when it's the same answer twice, but it still counts as two answers. So what you'd end up having then is you just say plus or minus square root of 11. Okay? And then again, you can check by plugging that in, and that'll show that both of those answers work. Okay? Okay, the next one will do the same way. So we'll say 0 equals 
x minus 7 squared minus 25. Okay, so what I'm going to do on this is I'm just going to move the 25 to the other side. You can do that in your head. So you get this, and then you do the square to both sides. The, the, you use the square root property if you have something squared equals a number. That's the ideal thing. That's what you look for. So now if I do square to both sides, don't forget you have a plus minus there. So you would have plus or minus 5 equals x minus 7. Okay, now you add 7 to both sides. This is a place where students a lot of times when they're learning this don't do this right. If you move the 7, just move it in front of the plus or minus. That's better to do it that way to me. So I'd have 7 plus or minus 5 equals x. And I don't want that answer. I want you to finish it up. So what you do is you say 7 plus 5 and you say 7 minus 5. That's what that plus minus does. It's just an abbreviation. So you would get 12 and you would get 2. So your zeros are 2 and 12. Another way to do this problem, but it's more work, would be to FOIL out the x minus 7, collect like terms, and factor. I wouldn't do it that way because it's more work than what I just showed you. And that's part of what you want to learn as a student is which method makes the problem the easiest. Okay, That's your idea on that. Okay. Okay, let's go through one more square root property. Then I want to kind of focus on completing the square, a little bit of quadratic formula. I do want to kind of get through. I'm going to probably skip around a little bit on this thing so I can at least by today get all the different techniques that we're learning. So this one you would start with 0 equals 2x minus 3 squared minus 18. So again, same thing, isolate, move the 18 to the other side. Don't foil it out. You could do it that way, but it's you know it's not necessary. Now do the square root of both sides. So you'd end up having this then. Okay? Now here's a background issue. We talked about this a little bit. When you have a square root, you want to break it up. So I use 9 times 2 because 9 is a perfect square. So that gives square root of 9 comes out of the radical, leaving you 3 radical 2. And yet that's necessary that you do that. So we would end up having plus or minus 3 root 2 is equal to 2x minus 3. Okay, so you definitely want to simplify radicals when it shows up. Okay, now I'm going to do the rest of it over here. So I have plus minus 3 root 2 equals 2x minus 3. Well, you've got to get x by itself, so you just move the 3, but I would put it in front of the plus or minus because that's the preferred standard way of writing this answer. So you'd have 3 plus or minus... 3 root 2 equals 2x now, then you can divide by 2. So it's just kind of standard equation solving, and you can write your answer that way if you want to. Um, generally, I think like when you're doing this on my math lab, they require you to write out both answers. Whoops, I'm doing that wrong. Which is not a bad thing because sometimes students, I can tell they don't know what the plus or minus means. It means there's two answers. One of them is the plus one. One of them is the minus one like that. So that's square root property. Those are the different things that you would encounter. I don't think you'll encounter anything that looks much different than those examples. Okay? All right. All right. Is everybody solid with that so far? Mostly this. If you've got good algebra skills about quadratic equations, you won't have much trouble with this section, I don't think. Okay. Completing the square... Um, to me, is not is the worst way to solve a quadratic equation. One of the reasons we teach this is because the quadratic formula comes from that process. So a lot of times the teacher will show where the quadratic formula comes from. So I'm going to do just probably two of these. I'm going to do this one and this one. I'm not going to worry so much about the 12. If I have time, I'll come back to it, and I may do that next week too. But I want to just get through two a basic two basic examples. Okay. All right, so when I say complete the square, and I've written out the steps above like this, again, you're going to set f of x equal to 0 because we're finding the zeros of the polynomial, and we're going to do this. To, to me, the ideal way to do this problem is the quadratic formula because that does not factor. But if I ask you to do complete the square, first thing you do is you, you look at two things. You want to make sure that the coefficient of x squared is 1. If it isn't, you've got to make it 1. And then the number, the constant, has to move to the other side. So what I'm going to have is 32 equals 
x squared plus 4x. That's how you want to start. All right, now here's what you do is this. You, you, you look at this middle term and you do this operation to it. You take half of that. You do this mostly in your head. So if you take 4 divided by 2, you get 2. Then you square the 2 to get a 4. You're always going to end up with a perfect square. And what you do is that result goes here. But if you put a 4 there, you've got to put a 4 there. So it goes like that. Okay, does that make sense? I can't remember if we did this earlier in the semester or not. It seems like I get confused with my different classes. But that's how you would get that started. And then this would be 36. Now this factors. And if you factor that, you would have x and x to get x squared. You'd have 2 and 2 to get 4. And then you'd have two plus signs like that. Okay, so that would give 36 equals x plus 2 squared. Okay. Now, do you recognize the problem? I hope so, because that's what I just taught you, right? Okay, you do the square root property now, and that's the purpose of completing the square, is you always end up with something squared equals a number. So now you do the square to both sides. Okay, and then you would have plus minus 6 here equals x plus 2. Okay, then you move the 2 to the other side, and you put that in front of the plus minus, so move the 2 to get negative 2 plus minus 6 equals x. And again, don't leave the answer that way. Go ahead and just crunch out the two answers. So one answer is negative 2 plus 6, which is 4. The other one's negative 2x minus 6, which is negative 8. So those are your answers. To me, that's a standard. That's the simplest example of completing the square. Yes? Uh, you can. Yeah, you're right. And, and uh, I thought originally it wouldn't when I looked at it, but it, since they turned out to be whole numbers, there's no doubt. If they end up having radical square roots, then it, you would have had to done the quadratic formula. Right. Okay, the simple ones are kind of will usually come out factoring anyway. Okay. Okay, let's do this 11. And again, I'm not going to do 12. This one's a little harder. Not, this one shouldn't be too bad, though. So uh, I'll kind of just do this one. We set, set this equal to zero. Then we have 3x squared minus 3x minus 6. So there's two things you always do at the beginning of your problem. The first thing is that 3 needs to be 1. And then the constant has to move the other side. It doesn't matter what order you do this in. What I like to do is just start by moving the constant. So I would have 6 equals 3x squared minus 3x like that. Okay, now, if I want the 3 to become 1, what do I do to both sides of the equation? I divide by 3, right. Okay, so I just divide everything by 3. And then this problem will actually work out a little simpler than I thought it would. So that is going to be 2 equals x squared minus x. Well, I'll have a fraction, so that's good. I wanted to kind of go through one that has a fraction. So that's how you start. If you forget to divide by that 3, it ain't going to work. Okay, you got because you got to end up with x plus or minus a number squared is the idea. Okay, now here's how completing the square goes. You look at the number in front, which is 1. So what you do is take that negative 1, you divide it by 2, and then you square it. So if you squared that, you would have 1 over 4. So that's the term you're going to use. And I would use 1 fourth. I wouldn't use a decimal. I mean, you could use 0.25, but you want to get out of that habit. Because if you had one-third, then the decimals are repeating three. So just use a fraction. So we're going to do this. We're going to add a fourth to both sides of the equation. Okay? And what's going to happen on this, then, if I do two plus a fourth, you can do it this way if you want to. That's just two and a fourth. And then you can change that to an improper fraction. So it goes like this. Two times four plus one would give you nine over 4. A lot of times students who haven't done that in so long, they forget how to do that. So that's how you convert a mixed number to an improper fraction. So I'm going to write this as 9 over 4. Then I'm going to do the factoring. And then the factoring, don't worry about the fact that it's a fraction. Just understand where that 1 fourth came from. So you'd have x and x, but where did the 1 fourth come from? Well, it came from here. It came from squaring the negative 1 half. So that means what you would put in is minus one half minus one half like that. So that's how the factoring goes. There's, you don't have to 
think about it, that, that factor is always going to be that middle term divided by 2. It'll always be that. So what you end up having from here is you would have 9 fourths equals x minus a half squared. Now it's the same process. See, that's what completing the square does is it gets you a term squared equals some number. Now what you do is you do square root of both sides, okay, with the plus minus there. And what we would have, I'm going to erase that little thing right there. What we would have is the square root of 9 fourths is 3 over 2. Square root of 9 is 3. Square root of 4 is 2. And then you would have x minus a half like that. All right? And then this one probably is another one that probably would have factored if we would have done it in the first place. So I'm going to slide the 1 half over there to get 1 half plus minus 3 over 2 equals x. And then you do want to finish up those two problems. So you want to do a half plus three halves. And then you want to do a half minus three halves like that. Okay? Basic fraction arithmetic. This is four over two, so that's two. This is negative two over two, so that's negative one. Okay? So your zeros are negative one and two. Okay? Now, like on your exam... I'm not going to test you over completing the square, and the reason is, is because what you're going to use completing the square for typically is like if you're working with conic sections. And if you go to Calc 3, you'll study a lot with conic sections, and that's where you actually use it. In practice, in a quadratic formula, the worst way to solve a quadratic equation is the way I just taught you. Okay, but it's a process you want to know for other reasons. So I don't check you over this on a on the exam next week. Okay, so I want to do a couple of more things. Now, I want to do just probably one quadratic formula. I only want to do one of those. And I'm going to probably do uh, this one right here. And, and then I want to kind of get down to the, the problems and kind of finish up class with doing some of the, the last ones, because a lot of times students don't have a good background for those. So your quadratic formula, and again, you have to know the quadratic formula. I don't give that to you. In higher math, no teacher is going to probably give that to you. It's, it, it's useful. It shows up a lot. So it's an expectation that you know how to do that. Okay? There is a, a song. Did anybody when they were in high school learn the quadratic formula song? Okay. Would anybody like to sing it for me? <laughs> I can't remember what it was. It has something to do with Pop Goes the Weasel or... I've heard another one with the Notre Dame fight song one time. <laughs> so anyway, you can YouTube it and you can put in um, quadratic formula song, and that's kind of kind of funny the way that's done. Some students have made videos that are kind of funny on that. So the idea with this one is you want to rearrange this so it would be x squared minus 3x minus 19, and then just identify a, b, and c. So in this particular problem, of course, a is the 1, B is the negative 3, and then C is the, the negative 19. Generally, students have absolutely no problem whatsoever plugging numbers into the formula. But there is a piece of this problem that sometimes students struggle with. So if that pops up in this, I'll kind of uh, point your attention to that. So now what you want to do is just plug into your formula. You can refer to the formula. So it's negative B, and B is negative 3. Then it's plus minus then square root of b squared, so you'd have negative 3 squared, and then 4ac, and then it's one big fraction bar, so it's all over 2a. So let's see, it goes like that. Now that part right there, students, I'm serious, I don't ever see a student have trouble with that part. So from here it's arithmetic, so you would have negative negative 3 is 3, uh, under the radical, that would be 9. Be careful with signs. I do see issues with that sometimes. So if you do that, I think that is, what is that, 76, I think is what that is. So that would be plus 76, and then it would be all over 2. All right? So now if I do this, you would end up with 3 plus or minus square root of 85 over 2. And then that square root of 85, that does not have any factors that have a square root in it. So that's already simplified. If this radical had, like if it was something like radical 18, 
then you would want to, you know, break it down, and that will happen sometimes in the quadratic formula. So that works like that. So that's it. Okay, quadratic formula. You want to know how to how to use that formula when it's when it's appropriate. Okay. All right, so that'll kind of take you through the basic things, the factoring, completing the square, square root property, and quad formula. I want to finish up with, I'm going to skip down to 18. I'm going to show you the way I like students to learn how to do these. I, my math lab may take you through what's called substitution. And to me, there's no reason to learn how to do this on this particular problem. I'm just going to have you factor. So um, to me, it's a lot easier to learn how to factor these. So number 18, again, we're going to set the function equal to 0. And then we're going to factor. Okay, To me, when you solve an equation that has exponents in it, your first thought process should be by factoring. Okay, And if that doesn't work, then you go on to different methods. So the thing about this one is, is it does factor. Okay. And it just goes like this. The first term is going to be x to the fourth. So what are you going to use? You're not going to use x and x. What are you going to use? x squared and x squared. Exactly. OK. The last term is uh, 49. And then the middle term is negative 50. So what are the two numbers you're going to multiply to give 49? 1 and 49, right. Because 1 and 49 add up to 50, right? So you'll put in a 1 and a 49 like that. Okay, now look how it factors. Okay, so this idea that inside term is 1x squared, that outside time is term is 49x squared, you're trying to make it add up to negative 50x squared, so you got it. Okay, if you struggle with factoring, I'm not kidding, write down those, that little diagram I did, the inner outer and what they're supposed to be equal, and you'll do fine. Don't try to overdo stuff in your head. So basically you get two minuses, so you'd have this and this. Okay. Now, I'm going to move this over here, and then we'll kind of talk about, there's actually two ways you could finish this problem. You could factor more, or you could just set each factor equal to zero and solve that way. Okay? Does x squared minus 1 factor? Yeah, that's the difference two squares. So it goes x plus 1, x minus 1. How about x squared minus 49? Same thing. Okay, so what you could do is you could do it this way. This is the way I'd usually do this, is that factors as x plus 1, x minus 1. The second one factors as x plus 7, x minus 7. So how many zeros do you have? You have 4, okay? So your zeros are going to be negative 1, 1, negative 7, and 7. Okay? I knew that, too, because the highest power was 4, so I got 4 zeros. Now, it is possible that the zeros can repeat, okay? If the highest power is 6, you get 6 zeros. If the highest power is 100, you get 100 zeros, although some of them repeat. That's the idea. Okay, so that's the way I'm going to show you how to do that is factor, because I think the problems I assigned you, they all pretty well factor anyway. Okay? So let's do uh, this one the same way, and then I'll um, probably just kind of finish this, this with this number 19 here, and then I'll go over couple of more of these on uh, next Monday's class. Okay, so again, just factor this. If you want to learn the substitution, I think you can do that on my math lab. So I'm just going to do this like this. That first term is going to be this, and the last term is going to be this. One thing that I do want to point your attention to is these things are going to factor. that, that Those exponents are double each other. So we call this a quadratic reducible equation. It's not quadratic, it's a quadratic reducible. And it has that same structure, but that first exponent is twice the other one. Okay, so what I'm going to do is factor this like this. Okay, so what I would use here is I would use x to the third and x to the third, and then what would I use for 8? 2 and 4 or 8 and 1? 8 and 1, right, because you're trying to make that become a 7, so you'd have 8 and 1, then you'd have a plus, and you'd have a minus right there. Now, the ideal way to do this, these are cubes. In, in intermediate algebra, you learn how to factor cubes. It's not necessary. What you want to do is take each factor, set it to 0, and then solve each equation. Because you can do that with a cube root property. So what you would do here, move the 8, so you'd have negative 8 equals x to the third, then you can do the third root of both sides. Yes? Wouldn't it have to be x to the 3 and 
x to the 2? Because x3 and x3 mm -mm. times each other is x3. No, uh, and I know what you're asking. See, if you look at this, look at the middle term. That middle term is 8x the third. That outer term is minus 1x the third. They have to be like terms, see. If you had 4 and 2, you wouldn't, the, the middle, the inner and outer would not come together to be like terms. Right, but if you were to FOIL it out, the first term would not equal x to the 6. It would equal x to the 9. If you had what again? If you were to, so to check your work, if you were to FOIL out the x3 plus 8 and x3 minus 1, the x3 times the x3 would be x9. No, okay. You're, doing, you're making a common mistake. X to the third times X to the third is X to the three plus three is X to the sixth. If you ever forget that, and say that's a typical thing that students get wrong. I mean, it's X to the third is just X, 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 okay? And then the other X to the third is another X, X, X. So it's six of them, okay? That's, uh, you're not the first person to make that mistake. That's pretty common. So anyway, what you'd have to finish up is you would have, now see, I notice I didn't do a plus minus because a cube root you can have a cube root of a negative, so that would be negative 2 equals x. So that would be one of your zeros. And on this one, you would move the 1 to the other side. You'd have x to the third. You would cube root both sides. Cube root of 1 is 1. It's not plus minus 1. It's 1. Okay, so you end up getting those are your two zeros or 1 and negative 2. Okay, does that make any sense? It's all factoring. That's the way I do the problems, okay? That substitution is fine to learn, but it's more complicated than what I'm showing you, and you're better off to be able to do it that way and understand how that factoring works, and you'll be in a lot better shape, I think. Okay, so that wraps us up today, uh, and then next week we'll... Um,